Okay, rock and roll, kid. Welcome to the Settlers of Soul podcast. This is Arius Dare. Our guest on this episode is Christopher Maslin. He's a professor at Daejeon Health Sciences College. While not exactly a settler of Seoul, Chris has lived in Korea for the better part of 15 years and has experienced what he would call a complete transformation over that time. It was in Korea that he first started lifting and taking fitness seriously, and now in his mid-40s, Christopher is in the best shape of his life, achieving top placements at Korean bodybuilding shows, appearing in magazines and model shoots, and even a few Korean movies. So it's a great conversation you're about to hear, one that I think was worth the trip to Daejeon. Uh, let's just call this episode Settlers of Mostly Seoul. My name is, my full name is Christopher John Maslon. I'm an American. Uh, I've been living overseas for 16 years. I'm a professor at Daejeon Health and Sciences College. Now, I first met you, Chris, um, at a competitive bodybuilding show. Yeah. And it was actually, it was quite surprising because not only are there not a lot of competitive bodybuilders in Korea, there are even fewer foreign competitive bodybuilders. Yeah, and so exactly. I was hoping you could actually start at the beginning. What What first got you into bodybuilding as a sport is that something you did back in the states and then you, you moved over here and continued with it or is that something you picked up here uh, what was your progression like there's a story behind the story i had come to korea in 2002 and uh, not that you were a university student at the time no i, I was uh, 31 when i had uh, come to korea and actually in fact just over there i actually point point to the school uh was uh, daejeon danga technical high school for boys and that's where I ended up. Uh, I had worked at that school uh, from 2002. I ended up in Korea at, during the World Cup, which is like the most exciting time, 2002. The, um, the <laughs> environment at the time was incredible. I worked uh, from that, that school from 2002 to 2005. However, April of 2004, something happened. I went to school, and I remember the day really clearly. I was walking up the stairs. It, my office was on the second floor of that building, and I lost my breath. I couldn't breathe. I don't know what happened. I was just so tired. I was exhausted. I was so weak. And I had called my fiancé at the time, and I had said, I need to go to the hospital. Something is wrong. She, she took me to the hospital here in Daejeon. I had a blood test, a scan. I mean, everything was done doctor says, oh, everything's perfect. Even your cholesterol is great. Go home. And I says, doctor, I'm dying. I says, I'm exhausted. I couldn't climb the stairs. And I remember the doctor at the hospital saying, how much exercise do you get? And I replied, X or what? I had, n I had never exercised in my life. And um, now I'm looking at, uh, at pictures of you from then. You weren't morbidly obese or anything. In fact, no, you're, you're pretty skinny. I came to Korea. Uh, I had a 30-inch waist. Uh, I was 130 pounds. So I know my stats at the time. It was it was 130, 30, 30. So I was 130 pounds, 30-inch waist, and a 30-inch inseam. I know that for a fact. Not a not a large person. No, no. I'm 5'7". I'm yeah, I'm 5'7". I fit into Korea perfectly. So that was the kind of moment for you where you realized, I need to get in shape. I need to get some exercise. And it was the first time in my life that I even, even thought about it. So um, the first thing I did was I started walking. And we had a rugby field over at Danga Technical High School. And I walked around the, the, the laps of this, this thing, um, the track, for months. And I was walking home one day. And I remember I looked up and there was... Uh, this guy in the window on a treadmill and he was sweating and I was outside freezing and I was like, that's what I need. And uh, I had gone to um, this place called Dream Health Club and I wanted to ask how much it cost to be on this treadmill. And when I got there to the health club, I met this boy named, uh, his name was Beck Sang Ki. And this kid had a really good physique. And I was like, wow. I was impressed, and he's a personal trainer, and uh, he was so interested in learning English, and he wanted to have uh, a native English speaker friend, and I wanted his physique, you know, I wanted to, to look like this kid did, you know, I was like, wow. We spent four years together training and speaking English, training and speaking English. Yeah, did you get a discount? Uh, we, we did it for free. We just wow. became best friends. I mean, I wasn't even paying him. We were just becoming best friends after four years, uh, his friend friend but he had an english friend had an english name was a korean guy he had an english name by the name of jimmy he walked right over to me and goes 
oh, hi, I'm Jimmy. And he goes, wow. He goes, you've got a nice physique. And I was like, huh? It was like the first time I actually woke up. that I realized that there was four years of training and bodybuilding that I was doing with Sankey. And he had told me, he says, oh, do you know about the Dejan bodybuilding show? And I remember that was May of 2009. And the three of us guys went to the show and I brought my, my Sony camera with me to take some pictures. We stood in the, we were in the middle of the, um, the audience. Remember they had the, the kids came out first and posed. And I took some pictures and the grandfathers came out and posed and they took some pictures. And then the regular, com the regular competitors came out and it was this absolute moment. I says, I will do this. So exactly one year to the date, May of 2010, I was on that stage and I learned how to prep and do all the other stuff. And I won. I came. I came in third or fourth place, and it was and your I, first show. My first show. That's really great. I was addicted like crack. I was, <laughs> was totally addicting. Do, do you remember what your lifting numbers were when you first started? Uh, my lifting numbers, like how much, how much I lifted, like that. Bench, deadlift, no, squat. No, I have it written down somewhere. Um, I started off uh, just basically gradually going into to bodybuilding as I just want to get in shape, and I had no idea that I was going to go on this journey. I see. So it. it probably just started with a lot of mobility, a lot of getting your form down. And yeah, it was just wanting to climb the stairs without huffing and puffing. And that's where it all began. And then, you know, I, you know, I sail upstairs now. I, I often say to myself, I'm in better shape than most 20 year olds that I meet. How old are you, Chris? I am 45. Better shape than, than most 20 year olds that I meet. Yeah. And probably the best shape in your life. Because you hadn't even started lifting until is, in the 30s. Is, it's been a real eye-opener. Um, when, when I've gotten uh, a chance to go to beaches, um, I, a backstory, it was um, by 1979, 1980, and, um, and I was horrified. You know, like this scrawny kid, you know, this pet, you know. I just, I, I never was, in, I was never comfortable with myself. And you can see from these photographs that I brought here, what, what I really look like. You know, I was always thin my whole life, uh, extremely thin. I mean, just really, really thin. I had a 14, maybe a 14 inch neck and suffered. It, I almost look like on the verge of being anorexic my whole life and finding clothes to fit me. Clothes just hung off of me like a coat hanger, you know? And uh, so we were at the beach and um, I remember it was just a horrible, it was a horrible time. Now, fast forward that, and um, behind you, there's a photograph on my wall, which you can't, which I will point out to you later. But I, I should set the stage for our listeners. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, we're in Deja now, we're at your office, mm -hmm. um, and you've got hundreds of photos all over the wall. 338 photographs are on the wall. So I'm looking to my right, and I'm looking at one of these photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a photograph of myself, my mom, my aunt, my daughter, and my wife and myself on a beach. And uh, it was what I consider one of the greatest days of my life because um, fast forward 30 years into the future, I stood on that very same beach. It was called Musquamacate Beach uh, from you know 1980 to 2000, uh, was it 2014? And I stood on that beach and I completely had forgotten that that was the exact same beach that, that I was ever on that beach that the, the memory came back to me when I was carrying a cooler of um, ice and sodas and something over the wooden platform and there was four college age boys that walked behind me and one of them spoke out well somebody knows how to take care of themselves and my mom turned to me she goes that was for you and I looked down and I woke up instantly I was like wow it was like the the I had a completely new body and I didn't know who I was. Now, what are your numbers now, lifting and measurements? Um, I can tell you. I can tell you my stats right now. Uh, I'm, I'm off season right now. I'm close to 82 kilos. Uh, my on season for our American listeners. Oh, what, what is, is that in pounds? Is that 180 pounds? 180 pounds. Um, my uh, on season stats to be on stage. I'm bantam, which is 64. 64, 65. So you're about eight, 18 kilos over right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a chub now. Yeah. I'm carrying them. You still look great. I, Thank you. Thank you. It's just a muscle chub right now. <laughs> the bulk phase. The bulk phase, yeah. Now, what about your bench and squat? Um, That's a nice thing about the off season is all your numbers. I always, get, I always get that. How much can you bench? And um, I usually ask something, how much do you weigh? How, well, so, so, how so, much so, do you, this, I'm asking you, how much do you, how much do you weigh? Oh, how much do I weigh? Mm -hmm. Oh, 
I haven't checked in a while. I think around 74 kilos. Okay, I can bench so you. 163, yeah, 165. Yeah, I can, I can bench you. Okay, just to let you know. <laughs> right, well, 165 is not, you know. <laughs> so, do you have any max numbers you can share with us? Uh, no, I'd rather not because um, that becomes very pretentious. I think in the bodybuilding world, that's pretentious. And that's just, I, I'd rather have the, the, the bodybuilding world, I believe, is uh, a, a place of equality and a place where we should enjoy things and not it's like look what i can do or not it's like that it's interesting you you say that i think that for a lot of people that is really a turnoff for going to the gym regularly. absolutely that people are like, you, you go there i have a you know some family that have tried to get in shape at various points in their life and you know i'll go with them to the gym i'm, I'm in pretty good shape and i mean n nothing competitive but you know I, I like to go to the gym i like to stay active and for me i, I really enjoy it mm -hmm. and so you know, I go there, I know what's up, I kind of know the rules, but I have family members that say, I just, I just don't get it. That's, that's not my scene. People, I, I, I don't yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. People walk in, they, just, they don't feel comfortable. Gyms are not a comfortable place to be. They're not welcoming. Um, they say that they feel alien, like it's an alien landscape. It's a strange world. What do I do? Where do I go? The first person that will walk through a gym will go right to a treadmill because that's the only thing that they can identify with. They'll never hit free weights or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean that was that was my experience when I first went to the gym. Um, yeah, you know, I was actually the I was the opposite of you. You know, I was uh, I was really overweight most of my life um, until about 17 or 18. I weighed close to 250 pounds. Oh, I envy you. My freshman year oh my in high school. I was I was always a, I was always the fat kid, right? I and envy so, you cuz you know, I I ended up losing over 100 pounds. I mean, my mine was you know, much, much less of an existential crisis as much as it was, I was a 16 year old boy and I started to like girls. Yeah. I mean, I mean it really was really that simple. simple. You start right. thinking and, to myself, wow, who's going to be attracted to me at, you know, like looking like this. You right. Know? Right. Like when you when you're young, it's like, I, I know a lot of people have various reasons for wanting to get in shape. Mine was very simple. Mm -hmm. It was very much driven yeah. by hormones. Yeah, hormones. Right? yeah, exactly. But so, you know, to go, to go back to, to gym culture then, you know, how would you describe, I know you that you didn't spend a lot of, a lot of gym time in the States, but how would you describe gym culture here in Korea? Golly jeepers. Um, there are so many gyms now. Uh, when I first came in uh, 2002, I don't remember even seeing a gym. But in 2004, I went to the, the Dream Health Center and all of a sudden there was this explosion, overnight explosion. There was gyms and health clubs and yoga clubs and fitness clubs and everything was everywhere. So actually, I think uh, Korea is kind of saturated with them right now. I think actually gym owners are actually having a hard time competing <laughs> for clientele. Now, if you were to if you were to describe the uh you know the demographic that goes in, you know, what what kind of people would you generally see uh lifting weights? Um college boys. There's a there is a college boy rush here to try to either lose some pounds or gain some muscle before entering the army. I see. Yep. So so it's it's younger college and then I guess later college. Yeah. And you usually get then you have gap then there. you have the grandfathers that come and they really don't lift. They just sit around and drink coffee in the gym and they think it's a social club. You know, I have found that to be one of the biggest frustrations is that I've been to a couple gyms here. I'm at I'm at one now near my house and the empty equipment, like let's say you have a bench, right? Mm -hmm. In the US, I'm so I'm I'm from the West Coast, mm -hmm. right? Typically, if you're not using the bench, you would keep it clear. If you're not using the bench, you would re-rack your weights, for right, example, right? Exactly. That's etiquette. Those two concepts, though, that like the etiquette is just different here, right? Yeah. I used to think that it was rude and it was inconsiderate, but the idea is that I'm not using this bench, so this is a perfect place for my phone. Yeah, it is a perfect place That's for, very my, for my towel, for, yeah. my, for my jacket. Yeah. Koreans kind of spread out. They add, there's a water bottle on one machine. They've got a towel on another thing. They've got their cell phone on another, and they're on the treadmill. And and nobody re racks. Nobody re -racks. nobody re racks. No, and so they just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> for me, for me, as like a signaling mecha mechanism, yep. I'm looking at the bench yeah. or the squat rack. You know, and I and I see. You know, there's 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 stuff everywhere. There's stuff everywhere. I'm like, yeah. are you done? Yeah. I I, I really yeah. don't know. And so you know, exactly. I've had you situations have to ask. where. Yeah. Yeah. And so and that's not rude. You just ask, yeah, yeah. are you done? Oh yeah. no, that's fine. Can yeah. I use this bench? Yeah. No problem. And yeah. they'll move it. It's not like yeah. it's it's a it's a hostile work yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, but so you walk into someone and say, "Just me da undang." You know, goodness. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's it's. I don't know. I, I've been here. I've been here close to three years, and uh, that's still a bit three frustrating. Years, but I, th I think that's because I was so used to. Yeah. So used to the American. Yeah. For me, for it. to me, it's been fifteen. I've been here for fifteen years, and uh, so you don't re rack your weights either, then. No, <laughs> I do actually. It's ingrained in me. Basically, it's ingrained. You know, to you know, when you're done using something, you're done using your, you know, done playing with your toys. Put them back in the toy box. You know, it's basic etiquette. Basic etiquette. Yeah. 
And what about diet? How do you feel yourself? Basically, when you are doing um, bodybuilding, you you go and eat. You're eating the best foods. Basically, you're eating the the best best beef, the best whatever. The the fruit. I'm been told, oh, don't eat fruit in the morning. You know, don't eat fruit because it spikes your insulin. But for myself, I do eat a lot of fruit. It's 25% of my food budget. And when I tell people I spend 35 to $40 a week on fruit, they're like, you've got to be joking me. That actually doesn't sound so bad. No. By Korean prices. Yeah, by Korean prices. Uh, a bunch of bananas here is uh, three fifty. dollars um, Four apples will set you back maybe about $6. So it's a lot of fruit. Uh, what about protein sources? Uh, my pro- my main protein, I cannot eat fish. I have a very unusual diet. Um, I can't eat soy. I can't eat uh, fish. The only fish that, that sits well with me is tuna, which I got lucky. I say kind of low budgety of all fishes I can eat, which is <laughs> there's a chicken of the sea. Yeah, so it's so it's a lot of it's a lot of tuna. Yeah, a lot fruit. Of, yeah, and chicken, chicken breast. I can't even begin to tell you about chicken breasts i mean like i will buy pounds and pounds and pounds and kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos of chicken breasts i will eat two chicken breasts uh probably in morning or afternoon you know i may have one more before night yeah i, I do the same thing i just will order 10 or 15 kilos at a time online bag you got these huge like, yeah right gro- right size bags. and if you order it in such a bulk quantity it's actually not too different right than u.s prices exactly there's a we have a, there's a great brand that i use through home plus actually i love it and uh, the quality and eating the right the right sources of protein and getting your your requirements is very important as a bodybuilder now in the in the u.s um there's a concept called uh if it fits your macros mm-hmm. and flexible dieting is, yeah. is, is quite in and a lot mm-hmm. of competitive bodybuilders will do that mm-hmm. i'm wondering if there's something that uh, or if there's a, there's a common theme among diet uh, among korean Competitive bodybuilders. Uh, is it very much macro focus? Is it clean eating? Let me uh, let me be very honest with you. Um, you have uh, long ago in the bodybuilding scene back in the nineteen sixties and seventies, there was just a very, in Korea. No, no, in, in the United States because bodybuilding didn't come to Korea until like the late eighties. Basically, um, there was a few guys that were doing it, but not like it is today. Like it's it's a thing now, you know, in Korea, it's, it's, there's a thing. The people that were like um, the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and, and those people that were doing it back in the 70s in Los Angeles and California, Muscle Beach and stuff, there wasn't anything that we have today. This whole explosion, this whole galaxy of weirdness has erupted. All of this uh, extra macros and micros and all of these supplements and all of that. If you take all that away, it just comes down to three basic things, lifting, eating, and sleeping. When you add commercial industry to stuff, something, it becomes a circus. And that's how I see the bodybuilding scene today. You've got people uh, that have created a, a cosmic uh, carnival of just from three simple things, they turn into this vast galaxy of just nonsense. There are bazillions of supplements that are worthless. There are exercises and this magazine and that magazine and this bodybuilding thing. And that is, it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. It just, just basically it's eating, training and sleeping. So do you, do you, do you find uh, something common that a lot of Koreans do or believe when they're preparing for a show, when they're, when they're training? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, um, they, they do have, they do have some beliefs. Uh, one of the most interesting thing that I've seen here in Korea is the slapping the, yeah, which, slapping. What? the slapping yeah this is very uh the first thing is that um they do they actually did, i'll tell you about two things the slapping and the sugar before a show korean guys will start slapping their friends after they have oiled them they'll slap their chest they'll slap their backs they slap they're slapping i don't know if i can even make a slap sound but it's like like that but on bare skin that's bare been skin out. until they're red and they believe that it will make their muscles bigger before they go on stage. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I was. I, I actually found someone who spoke English. I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, increasing muscle size. I'm like, okay, if that's what you believe, sure, okay. And But this isn't just a couple guys you're saying. You're saying, like, you're going to go to a show and backstage, every guy is slapping every other yes. guy. Yeah, they're slapping. They're oh. slapping their legs. They're slapping. They're, they're just slapping. They put the oil on and they start slapping. 
And then number two is sugar. I go to a show and there's like 25 guys walking around with lollipops in there. there. I'm like, what are you guys eating? I, I thought they were like skinny cigarettes or something that weren't lit. And I finally went over to one guy and I said, you got some more in me casa. What is this? He pulls down a lot of I'm like, huh? And they told me that they believe that the sugar makes your muscles bigger too or increases. Uh, <laughs> like the veins are popping or something. I'm like, okay, if you if you believe that, sure. Well, it may it may work, but you've been able to place in 14 out of 16 shows without mm-hmm. slapping or lollipops. So Correct. Yeah. <laughs> At least on the West Coast, your typical gym is going to be a chain, so a 24-hour fitness, an LA mm-hmm. fitness. It's going to be big, expansive. You've got plenty of free weights, machines. Yeah. Um, maybe you have some standalone rooms for your yoga, for your spinning. Yeah. Right. But you know, the, the idea of a gym is just kind of this large space with weights. Right. right? Yeah. In, in, in Korea, and maybe this is because you, know, you don't have a lot of space, but you see a lot of these personal training studios where it's basically just like a box. Yeah. Uh, you, you might have a rack, you might yeah. have, you might have some weights, mm-hmm. but, but it's much more focused around the trainer specifically. Mm-hmm. And that trainer could do free weights. Uh, they could do Pilates. Yeah. They could do yoga. Yeah. Uh, they could do lots of things. And so I, I'm wondering, is, is that the same in Daejeon? And, and, and if so, you know, do you think that that's an effective way, an effective approach towards fitness? So you're saying one-to-one training, one, one-to-one training. Yeah, or, or, or even just the idea that you need to work very closely with one person in a, in a much smaller space rather than go to a gym with dozens or hundreds of people at the same time. Uh, if you know the road that you're on, you don't need a map. Basically, if you have to, have, if you need a trainer, if you need a trainer, I think that 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 type of person has never done their homework, has never researched, has never looked for themselves. Basically, they realize either they're fat or they're skinny. And like, oh, I need help. Okay, but you should go out and look for yourself. Find find an answer. Be a little bit more independent before it's, you know throwing fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty dollars at somebody and they're just telling you something that you can already find out for free um, that's already out there. So then if uh, if somebody were in Korea and they were interested in competitive bodybuilding, mm-hmm. what exactly is the process? Do you just find the biggest guy at your gym and ask them, hey, how do I sign up? <laughs> Not exactly. Uh, the first thing is that it, you need to know about what bodybuilding is. Bodybuilding is the ripping and tearing of muscle cells. Basically, you go and you lift a weight and you're putting it back down again. You're lifting and and you're causing stress and small tears within the muscle. And then going home and then eating a diet that's rich in protein and minerals, you are repairing the cells and they're getting bigger. And this process takes years. And I love, when I was working as a, a college student at a paint store, I met a bodybuilder and he goes, it takes years. And it was such a turnoff when I had heard him say that, but I would had no idea that in the future I would actually be doing what he had said. I thought, well, that's just his gig. It's not my gig. But his advice that day was, it takes years. So now I'm sitting here doing this interview and I'm like, it takes years to be uh, a bodybuilder. It isn't, it isn't overnight. And Korea is a very quick country. They want everything tomorrow morning. They want the packages delivered within the hour. Bali, bali. Oh, bali, bali lifestyle. And um, no, uh, there there are shortcuts, but they're as uh, I say this as quickly as you rise, you fall. So basically, there if you uh, go up very slowly, the reward stays forever. Um, Grow strong, not fat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So pun there. Going slow, slow and steady wins the race. So if you want a physique that's going to last for 10, 15 years, that's outstanding. You know, a natural, slow bodybuilding style is the ultimate style. Uh, You were talking to me about chemical, chemical bodybuilding. The people that are doing chemical bodybuildings, there's a dark side to that. Once you get into that, yeah, you blow up. (laughs) Instantly, you got to stay on that forever because once you stop, you deflate like a balloon. And not only that, but your body has now adapted. Oh, it's to worse. Artificial than, levels of testosterone. It's, it's worse than that. It causes um, uh, thyroid problems, uh, testosterone uh, deduction. Uh, it causes liver problems. Uh, you name it. Uh, hair loss. Uh, there's. It's more controversial and more dangerous than we ever knew. I'm trying to think about you know, the, the biggest guys at the gym, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of middle ground in, in the U S you can go to a gym 
and there's there's people of all spectrums, right? Yeah. I mean, you you got the guy who's who's clearly who's clearly juicing, mm-hmm. and then you know you got the college student that's just kind of there. Maybe he's got a date that Friday and he just wants to get a pump before, right? right? Exactly. In Korea, I, I've really noticed you've got like a zero to a ten. Yeah. Right. You've got guys that are juicing yeah. or guys that are just clearly out of their element. Right. right? There's 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 very very few in between. Mm-hmm. The chasm. The, yeah. yeah. The chasm. Is it is it just that easy to get? Is it is it so cheap? Is is there a misunderstanding about the health risks that you're talking about? No, there's a desire. You know, you have um, people that are. Is it just that Bali Bali culture that you're talking about? Uh, you're talking about here in, in Korea. In Korea. In, in Korea. Korea. Um, for those who want it, go after it. And basically, if you if you desire to to do that type of lifestyle, you 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 go after it. Um, not to say that everyone's doing it, um, but. Uh, you know, it exists and therefore you have to accept it. You have to accept it that there are some people that just want to be natural looking. There's other people that want that hugeness. They want to be the, the, the big person on the stage and they're competing. That's their lifestyle. For myself, I'm a college professor. I am not a, a professional bodybuilder. I, you know, it's my hobby. If you separate those two worlds, if you separate that I am a college professor, you realize, oh my gosh, this is not my life. You know, I don't have to pour my whole entire life in that. You like it. You don't love it. You love your family. I, yeah, I love my family. Love your life. I love my life. You don't like, love yeah, bodybuilding. Body. Yeah, you know, I, I do have, I have a love for, I have a love for bodybuilding, you know, but it is not the end all end of my existence, basically. Um, I have built a physique where I can take off my clothes anywhere, anytime. I actually make up excuses to take off my <laughs> clothes. Um, remember I was in a, a department store and I was uh, trying on, pants and uh, my wife says why wow, the dressing room's like 10 meters your, away let she, me just yeah she says why is your shirt off i came out of the i came out of the uh, dressing room she goes why is your shirt off you're, you're trying on pants i'm like <laughs> just in case you know someone walks by i have to check, <laughs> check out these pecs i'm bouncing i mean left and right so shirtless way guy hey check it out hey here's a free show <laughs> So you, you said you're a, you're a professor uh, yes. here. Um, so yeah, and once again to reiterate, uh, even though we are we are called settlers of soul, uh, let's expand that to settlers of mostly soul because mm-hmm. we are sitting at Daejeon University of Sports and Health Sciences. Actually, it's Daejeon Health and Sciences College. Oh, excuse me. Yes, there's no sports here. <laughs> I saw you know I saw a field. You saw around. the kids doing the soccer downstairs. Yeah, yeah right. but yeah, it so, should be though. I like that idea. How did you get the job, and um, you know how do you, how do you like living in Daejeon and, and, and teaching here? You've been here now fifteen years. Fifteen years, I love it. Absolutely love it. I wouldn't trade it in for anything in the world. I would not trade the last decade and a half for anything in the world. Why Daejeon? I mean, it, as as a, as a white guy, yep, white guy. it's basically soul or nothing. So in Korea, it's always someone you know. It's a very connect, family connective thing. So I know this guy, and you know, we'll get you set up. And, and so that's how I ended up here. I see. So so. It's just kind of built on itself, and now a decade and a half later, you have such a strong network here. Yeah, that very, removing very yourself very, out of that and starting yeah. over somewhere else would just be—it'd be detrimental. You know, basically, Dejan is home. How do you uh, how do you sell people on on coming here? Uh, you know, let, let's say you're Dejan. considering moving See, to Korea. Extremely, Dejan is a very family oriented place. You want to raise a family? This is the place. That's to do exactly it. what the twenty year old English teacher is thinking of. Yeah, raising sure. a family. <laughs> family. <laughs> Making babies and yeah, raising up. No, um, when you go to Seoul, there's pushing, there's shoving. Uh, it's a constant. You're surrounded by bodies. You know, ten million souls vibrating is all around you. And you come to Dijon, there's space. You have this this space. You can stretch out your arms and walk down the sidewalk without nobody like bamming into you. You know, it's like there's there's space here. You know, there's space to breathe. But so there's I I I feel like <gasps> this not <laughs> I feel like you're choking. I feel like, like I'm claustrophobic. Yeah. So you have a you have a wife. Do you have any children? I do. I have a beautiful daughter. She's mixed. Her name is Elizabeth, and her Korean name is Jihae, which means wisdom. What's it like being a a Wegogun dad here? Uh, it's got its ups and downs. Uh, I crave to be back in the United States. I would love for my daughter to be raised more like I was raised, where there was um a yard and trees and. Uh, uh, I had virtually incredible amounts of free time. My daughter's being raised in a kind of a cement environment, and she's got tons of homework, and uh, she's being engineered to be a test-taking kid. And is she in the Korean public school? System? Yeah, she wow. is, and she's at the top of her class. And we are beyond. We are beyond proud of her. How did you make that decision to 
enroll her in the Korean public school system. Um, I know that a lot of foreigner families here, or even you know the Caucasian mom or dad, they'll generally do the English Pri- yeah, private school. Yeah, private school. So that must have not been an easy decision to make. We had learned that Daejeon had one of the best middle schools ever. It was like set, it was settled in the 1960s. I think it was 1965. This school uh, was open. It was uh, Kayan Kayan Middle School. And uh, we went there, and I was fascinated with meeting the teachers. They all had histories and backgrounds. They had traveled. They could speak English. I was like, this is a great place. Let's just dump her off here. And, and she's thrived. This kid has thrived. And lots of friends. You know, so, okay, this is the place to be. Now, is she, is she fully bilingual? Yes. That's excellent. Yeah, yeah. I love how she can flip in between two languages in a split second. She changes over from Korean into English in a split second. She'd be like talking to my wife and then all of a sudden, bam, she hits me with something in English. I'm like, how did you do that so quickly? <laughs> now, do you think there's any there's any specific challenges uh, to raising a bilingual multiracial child here? Uh, I mean, you're, you're in Daejeon, right? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It really, so it's Seoul and, the place, and then there's everywhere this else. The, this is right? the great place. This is the greatest place in, in Korea to do it. In Dijon. Yeah, Dijon. It, I, it's very family oriented here. I, I wish I had uh, made, you know, had more children. I really do. I wish I had three. And if they were all girls, that'd be even great. At what point did you then, I guess, turn into the competitive bodybuilding white guy that everybody knows to contact for movies, for modeling, for for all these things? Because you know, again, to, yeah. to set the stage for uh, our listeners here, you know, we're sitting at your desk and you've just got, you know, you've got your yeah, modeling got my portfolio, portfolio you've here. Got, you've got like these these movie trailers. You've got mm-hmm. all these different things. Yeah. You know. Where did you go from, you know, four years of, of, of really serious training to, to now? The, the story goes, um, I had finished uh, my last uh, bodybuilding show, and uh, I had a, a friend named Savetta, and she had, without asking my permission, she put my name on this group of, uh, looking, there was a, a modeling agency, and they were looking for guys with good physiques, and they were looking for commercials and they were going to do some, they were selling some kind of product or something. And she typed my name in. So a platinum modeling agency called me and they said, send us your portfolio, send us everything. So I sent that in there. Recently, I've been contacted by another one. I have a total of five modeling agencies that I've worked with here in Korea. And uh, the, the best one uh, had contacted me for a movie. It's called Gong Jack and it's going to be out in November. And I play a professor in the movie it's set in 1993 and it was a world peace conference that was going on so i'm in the beginning of the movie with uh five foreign professors at the conference and then all of a sudden the siren the north korean sirens north korea is attacking and they've got trouble and i guess it's based around real events that actually really happened so i'm, I'm very lucky to be in this movie so i, I play a visiting professor so did you, did you take your shirt off and flex? No, it would be nice that, but I look really nice with the 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 sweater that they put on me. They got this gold nice cardigan. Yeah, the gold and... card, cardigan with the gold glasses, and they pulled my hair back and gave me a tie. And they really and hair and makeup really did a good job on me. I looked I look older. I look like I belong there. You know. And you, I understand you also have a website, and that's kind of been a launching off point for you as well. Yeah, I have Mass Salon Health and Fitness a site that's connected to Facebook, and it's got three thousand five hundred followers now. I have an Instagram. An interview with a Spanish magazine in Spain, Barcelona. I did that bodybuilding there. Been in um, a train magazine out of England, which was printed in Las Vegas. Uh, someday I hope to be on the Las Vegas shows. I want to do a Las Vegas bodybuilding show. That would be a dream come true. And I'm going to do it before. California I'm, also. Some, California, some, some yeah. I, I want to do West Coast. It's kind of hard living in Korea and then flying all the way over there and being a professor. Now, if I was a full-time bodybuilder and I was a pro- professional bodybuilder, it's my job. I can just take off time whenever I want because you know, I'm training at the gym and then, hey, I'm going to take off this week and I'm going to fly over to you know California and go do a show. But as a professor, I cannot. There is a powerful element of being a white man in Korea, being a professor and a bodybuilder, because bodybuilding and being a professor don't mix here. You cannot be in education and be a bodybuilder. I think you can. Uh, you could probably make a lot of money if you go to China. They actually have an entire industry of rent a white guy. Exactly. Yeah. Rent a bodybuilding rent professor. A, yeah, rent a bodybuilding professor. Now, do you think it's easy to break into that modeling casting industry? I'm sure maybe when you first came here, there was a premium on, on Western talent mm-hmm. or, or lack thereof. Let's say, yeah. let's say Western faces. Yeah. And clearly, you know, you're coming in not looking like the rest of these, of these other guys and mm-hmm. girls. But, you know, let's say you're just an average looking 
Joe Schmo. Yeah, Joe, Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo. And uh, you, you think, oh yeah, you know, I could, I could act better than that guy they got for so and so drama. It all comes down to confidence. It does. I mean, if you have the confidence to do it, not everyone is built. Not everyone is built to be an actor. Not everyone's built to be a model. Not everyone's. You had to want it. And not only that, but you have to have that kind of invested inside you that you have the confidence to do it. I remember the guy from the uh, KBS television just, well, they had the camera, the microphone, they jammed it in my face. And I'm like, okay, it's showtime. And it's like that same thing when I'm teaching. When I walk through that door, everything, my problems, everything is left outside. As soon as I walk through that classroom door, showtime. I received an award this year uh, for being the best teacher. You know, what I love about all this is like, you didn't actually do any of this until you were like in your forties. This blew me. Yeah. I'm a late bloomer. I'm <laughs> extremely, extremely late bloomer. You weren't like a 17 year old me nam who could sing no. and, and do whatever. Like, no. You were like an old Ajashi. No. I was, who's now, no. Who's now doing modeling yeah. and, and all these things. Yeah. That's I, great. It's never too late. It's never too late. And I feel like the future is only getting brighter. I can't wait to see what my fifties bring. So do you see yourself traveling to 120 countries? Or I, do you, do you want to live out the rest of your years here in Korea? I I love, day, I love Korea uh, immensely. Um, I miss my family back home in, in the States. Um, I've been to 44 countries. Been to 44 countries. Um, I received a postcard from a friend in high school. Her name was Christine Phillips. And um, I was so jealous over that postcard. I swore that day that I opened the mailbox that says, I will travel. And given the jumping point that Korea is, I see it as the jumping point for all these countries and uh, in 2002, I had traveled all over Europe, and I've been traveling ever since. Um, Do you take your family? Absolutely. Uh, I've been to 44 countries. My wife has been to 28. My daughter's been to 12. Our next, our next point would be England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Well, you didn't answer my question, though. Are you oh. going to settle down in any of those countries? Oh, or are you going to use Korea as your launching off point? I'm planning on buying a house here. Wow. Yeah. And I remember I went up to the days on reservoir and i saw this piece of land and i says i want it i want this i want to build a house right here you know and my wife was like okay and uh, i actually see myself settling here in dejan how big is the uh is the expat community here uh fifteen thousand. oh it's pretty big yep actually it's that's a lot that's a lot bigger than i would think thousand. We're, um, you know, 1.5 million. We're, we are 1%. Now, do you, do you mostly socialize with, uh, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of Korean friends through, uh, through weightlifting. Yeah. Um, I mean, huge, is, a huge, is that, is that primarily your social circle then? No. That you built up? Uh, no, I'm also a designer. I have a degree from Columbus College of Art and Design, and I, I have a, I have a five-year degree in design and I had come to Korea and I wanted to do uh, classes where I was just doing design work and just uh, randomly the chairman's daughter who is also a professor here at my college had uh, her and I had gone out to a dinner and she has she had heard through another professor that I had a de design degree and she says I want to know if you want to teach art at our school and I was like I, I literally almost fell off the seat when she said that I was like so not just being an English teacher but teaching design, it's like the job is like you go from a completely new world. It's, a, it's, a, it's something you crave. You want to do something other than teach English. When you do something that you really love, like I love teaching, teaching art and design here at the college. It's, it's like a dream come true. It's a really it's an amazing thing. Why, why leave? <laughs> why? You're asking, do you want to go? No, I don't want to go home. You know? I don't think I'd ever get a job like this back in the States. I really don't. And the amount of time that I have off as a college professor is amazing. Four months paid a year, right? Um, five, five. I have five months off because we follow the we follow the um, what do you call it? the rotation schedule of the students. So I have a three months off in winter and two months off in summer. Yeah, that's, I, I need that to, is salary. I need, I need to think of a career change. Yeah, that's um, yeah. All right, Chris, mm -hmm. we're at everybody's favorite part of favorite Settlers part. of yeah. Mostly yeah. Seoul. Yeah. That means the show is almost over. Okay, I'm going to reload here. Okay. <laughs> it's the rapid fire round. Rapid fire round. My, my first question is, hmm. if you could describe the way you felt about your physique at 25 years old in three words and now at 45 years old in another three words, what would those words be? Oh, my gosh. Three words. Only three words? Only three words. Felt like toothpick. 22. Feel like Hulk, <laughs> 40, 45. How's that? It's almost a haiku there. Yeah, totally. I feel like a completely different person. When I stand in front of a mirror, it's taken a while for me to recognize who I am. It's hard to buy clothes because I'm ill-fitted now. I, I've got biceps that are 16 and a half inches around. 
I got it, you know, my chest is 44. You want, you want some st- statistics now. My waist is 32. I can't fit into skinny jeans, okay? It looks, I look odd. Clothing shopping, when I first came to Korea, I was in size 90. And then today I'm in 105. So I went from 90 to 95, 100, now I'm 105. I've jumped four sizes since I started bodybuilding. And that's just in 10 years. How's that? That's uh, more than three words, but we'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, you gave us that. So what is the uh, what is the biggest bodybuilding show here in Korea? Muscle Mania. I would say Muscle Mania is the biggest one. And then there's WBC after that. And, and by, by big, how many participants are we talking here? Uh, about 300. 300. 300 guys are on stage. And there, there, there's this, we have a group of girls, uh, some of the most beautiful girls. You want to see some most beautiful girls. That you're gonna, you go to Muscle Mania, and these girls have got glass slippers on. They're diamonds. You know, it's, it's a real show. And then to get photographed with them, to be, you know, the photographer will grab me and say, you and her. I'm like, oh, my gosh. If you insist. If you insist, I'll uh, yeah, take, take 100 photographs. I'll post any way you want. Where does the funding come for these shows? Are there, are there private companies that will kind of, you know, like, for example, in the U.S., you've got Red Bull. You've got kind of these extreme type branding that goes into the, yeah. uh, the shows. But what about here in Korea? Because it, it's not so big yet. I mean, it, it is, let's say, let's say weightlifting is big, but mm-hmm. competitive weightlifting is not. Yeah. Uh, where does the money come from for the shows? Well, every competitor spends about $300, 300 you know, It's like some shit man won. Uh, to enter the show, you got to do registration and all this other stuff. And, it, you know, God forbid you have to have a hotel and money. You're up there for two days. A muscle minion goes for two days. Right. So I'm up there for two days. And muscle minion is usually out of uh, out of Seoul. Yeah, it's a huge show. It's usually a two day show, and um, it attracts a quite a crowd. So there, you know, they, there's a sold out audience, and uh, you're in front of you know maybe about three thousand people. And the the great thing is that there are companies that sponsor. So you've got companies that produce uh, products or uh, foods or equipment or whatever. They help sponsor those shows as the competitors give money and then we get the trophies, basically. Um, If you look at bodybuilding from a completely different angle, you spend years of your life lifting, dieting, training, and in the end result, you spend all this money and then you get a plastic trophy. Well, and, and hopefully and a huge the, list of clientele that will pay you, you lots and lots, lots of money, of money so. or tips. And I would say, and what, but the reward is the physique. The reward is the physique. Like I said, I was on the beach and just taking off my shirt. I was like, wow. Well, you know, I might, I might even add to that. The, the reward is doing something really, really hard. Yeah. And, and, and that determination and that grit and that self-discipline that it requires. Self-discipline. Uh, I never knew I had it. I never, I never knew. I never knew that I had I didn't know I had that in me, self-discipline to go out and lift weights. I, I couldn't believe it. And to every day eat the same foods day after day and dieting for 16 weeks. And everyone else is eating you know, hamburgers and junk food all around Sung you. Up side. Yeah, all the great smelling stuff. And you know, what they don't tell you is when you are 3.4% body fat and you are cut and you're, you, know, you smell wafting food from a restaurant, it's painful. No one told me that before I was going into bodybuilding. How you suffer it, sir. So you suffer for that 15 minutes on stage. You really do. You're in the best shape of your life. Shape, you, phys- like photographic, you know, photographic. You are. Right. You are the iconic Greek god. But from in terms of energy levels and just how we are overall feeling. I mean, mm. the fatigue is just overwhelming at that point. You are tired. You don't move around a lot. Basically, you sit and conserve as much energy as possible. You try to uh, drink your liquid calories to get it in, but you wait for the show is over and you see people binging, they eating all this junk. Uh, my thing is that I've done four, sh- I do four shows a year, you know, or three shows a year. So the first show is hard. We have to wait three, four weeks before you do the second show. So it's a constant, yeah, it's a long waiting. I've learned patience more than anything in bodybuilding. So determination and patience. As intimidating as some of these guys look, uh, that actually the community is, is extremely friendly and welcoming and, and always willing to, to help those that are, that are interested. Uh, how would you describe the community, uh, the scene here in Korea? Is it, is it ultra competitive? Is it friendly? Is it welcoming? Uh, for, from a foreigner point of view? Or just in general. Yeah, I have, I have uh, brothers and sisters of iron. Another bodybuilder will see me and I will do something crazy. I remember I was down in um, Suwon. It was, I think it was in Suwon. And I saw this guy across from the parking lot. And all I did was double 
bicep flex like this and he looked back and he he, he mimicked me he we both think it's like instant friendship instant friendship because he knows what i'm going through and i know what he's going through and i know what his dream is and i know what my dream is and it's like it's that look you give other guys when you know they work out you too. salute them you put your arm up like that do you, you they know they know your mind they know your mind they know what you're doing it's, so it makes a little difference that you're not i've, I've made instant friends all over the world and this is not just it's not just here in korea but friends all over the world from you know south africa germany france um I'm trying to think of all the other countries thailand uh Singapore, uh, uh, Japan, Canada. I think of all the other competitive bodybuilders. That lots. I've been, lots and lots and lots. The list goes on and on and on. So if you ever opened up your own gym here in Daejeon, what would you call it? Oh, Maslon Health and Fitness would be a great name. Um, but my, my wife says it has to be really simple. It has to have a, a, like a more of a, a simpler name. you know. So I, I'm not, I don't know what kind of a name I would name it. As the foreign population is growing here, in Korea, and it's continuously growing. A foreign style gym would be welcoming with an English speaking staff, with an English speaking staff, and a Western. When you walk into an American gym health club, I want to bring that over here. I would really like to have it. When you walk into a Korean gym here, they have this uh, body fat shaky machine. It's got a belt on it, which is uh, it's straight out of nineteen eighty five, right? 1930s if you do your history on that and it's a, they think that it uh it's going to shake off the fat and uh there would be none of those type of weirdness at my gym so it wouldn't, with that wouldn't exist i i feel like they just have that so that when the ajumas and ajashis come in and ask where it is yeah they can point them to that right <laughs> yeah say, say, why it's don't you have this what, what, i'm going to another gym yeah i'm going over there well you know um for for myself, I would have it uh, the facilities a little bit more private, and uh, we would have staff that would re re rack the weights. Uh, I would make sure the mirrors were kept clean. I, see, I would I would go one step further than the staff. Okay. I would put it in the contract. You you must re you must re rack your weights. Yeah. Every exactly. time every time you're observed not re mm-hmm. the weights, we're gonna take one month out of your. That out of your sounds membership. like hey, I like that instant. Take it right off your visa card. Done. Right, exactly. How would your students describe you as a professor? Oh, they have they they call me they call me Mom Jang Kusanim. My teaching style is called edutainment. I entertain the students while educating them. And I received uh, the best teacher award. They believe that I'm funny and I, I genuinely I genuinely go into every class and put on the show that I want those kids to walk out with and going, "Wow, English class was fun." But I want to be remembered as my college. I, I had a college professor. Her name was Carol Griffiths. To this day, I'm friends with her on Facebook, but her style of teaching was um, slow, steady, meticulous. She talked about style. She talked about technique. She ingrained in the students a quality of something. She drove something home. I learned from her, and um, she was uplift. She was also an uplifting professor who kept me in college and i took with me back to korea that style i'm going to go and i'm going to teach the most boring subject that these students don't don't want to learn through the the concept they always say hell chosan i hear that a lot hell chosan and i'm going to turn it all around i'm going to turn this around i'm going to make this the most easiest bestest class they ever had and it it just it catapulted me to getting the best teacher award in my school, and only three professors have ever received it. What would your autobiography be called? The Life and Times of Christopher Maslon. Oh. <laughs> you, you, I feel like you've thought about that before. Yeah, yeah. Along with the name, I of got your a gym. book. Uh, I got a book. I can't. It's secret. I cannot tell you the title of the book until it's published. Going on sixteen years now. Going going into my sixteenth year, uh, I have kept a journal for more than a decade and a half. The stories that I have collected from being a white man, seeing through the eyes of a white man, Korea. I'm a stranger in a strange land, and I'm I will publish this, and it will be I will take out the absolute center of the meat of every story and compress it into a book. I I guess we should have a breaking news uh, moniker to this episode. Breaking news. Breaking, Christopher Maslin's oh, book yeah. is coming out. Oh, break, yeah. Breaking news. Christopher Maslin's book is coming out. Has it been started? Yeah, I have I have some rough drafts. I've done some revisionaries to it. Um, I think it's going to take me a little bit longer. 
I can tell you that it's it's going to start off. The first chapter is myself being in the hospital room holding my daughter and looking down at this newborn baby and realizing, how did I get here? You know, I came as an English teacher. I came to Korea with uh, two suitcases. And I come, I walk out with this family and this household with the stuff and a kid. And it just is, is it, it's mind boggling, you know, where you really be. wonderful. Yeah. To um, this book will, will focus on the incredible, bizarre, unusual, cultural, God smacking stuff that Korea has awoken me. Korea never changed. I changed. I came here. I'm like every day. I think that's why you're so happy. Here. Yeah. I, every day is new here. There's never been a boring, I was like, there's no boring days. I have not gotten bored yet, you know? It's just like you wake up and every day there's some new challenge that just appears, whether it's a speaking challenge or a um, cultural challenge or a translation challenge or trying to get an idea across. Korea will challenge your mind, you know? I've been to all these countries all over the world. It, this place still blows my mind. It just blows my mind. What's the biggest mistake you see at the gym? People not knowing what they're doing. They walk in, they want to change their bodies, and they go from machine to machine to machine to machine to machine. Like they're lost. A ship that goes from point A to point B has a direct course, a schedule. You see young guys that are in 20s and they will be doing some chest press. Then they'll be working legs. Then they'll be on the treadmill. Then they'll be doing back. Then be, This is all in one day, this is all within one hour. And the full walk. body group. The full body. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just hoping that by a miracle, I'll get from point A to point B and look like you. Bodybuilding, Choyo? Like, do you like bodybuilding? If they say yes, then we're on one road. If they say, I'm fat or jibang, jibang, pointing to their stomach, it's a completely different road. And I will work with this. So I, I am a PT in, in a way. Um, and I'm giving back to the community as like given to me, you know, kind of like uh, when uh, I was learning how to bodybuild in the beginning, it was free. Basically, I was trading English for free PT. So I was like, you know, it, it's free. Everything's free, you know. So it's a barter economy. Yeah, it's with barter. your English skills. Exactly. Hey, you want to learn some English? Come on, come with me. What are three books that you would recommend to understand the Korean experience? Or if not, what are just three of your favorite books that you've read? Uh, the first book was called um, Culture Shock. I know that it was written by two Indian authors. Uh, I remember her name was Sonia something. Uh, Culture Shock. It's available on Amazon.com. I read that book from cover to cover, and it every word in there is true. Culture Shock. Uh, Korea Culture Shock. That was number one. I had read a, a Korean cartoon book written by a Korean author who had lived in the United States. He's written like 10 books about culture. It's amazing how each and every little cartoon shares a specific part of Korean culture. And I learned from reading this cartoon book about this one. And the third book I have is right up there. It's called Ugly Korean, Ugly American. And uh, it talks about how we are so different. <laughs> what we do that, that really drives Koreans crazy and what they do that it drives us foreigners crazy. Is there an end goal for bodybuilding with you? Are you going to reach a point where you're just going to Re say, I've made it, made it, retired? I'm no. done. No. Um, I had worked so hard for this physique. Ernestine Shepard is an African American woman who uh, started bodybuilding. She's the oldest competitive bodybuilder in the, in the world. She's 80 years old. She has the body of a 20 year old woman. And she started because her sister had come to her in a dream. Her sister had died, and her sister had come to her in a dream and said, you've not done what I've asked you to do. And she started to take up bodybuilding, and she's the world's oldest bodybuilding competitor. So I think I think the answer to the question is, you're going to stop bodybuilding when you're an 80-year-old Yeah, I, Maybe woman. when I'm 80. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to continue to have this physique in, in my 60s. I want, I want to be a freak, freak grandpa. It's never too late, guys. It's, it's never girls. too late. Never too late. <laughs> so, Chris, where can uh, where can people connect with you? Uh, they can they can contact me on Maslon Fitness on that's M A S L O N, L -O -N Fitness F I T N E S S on Facebook. They can find me. Uh, and uh, if amazingly enough, if you just Google my name, I'm a subject. 
There's hundreds, <laughs> I'm not joking, hundreds of photographs of me bodybuilding. All right, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This is quite an honor. Thank you to my guest, Chris Maslin. If you like the show, please do rate Settlers of Soul on iTunes. It's the fastest way to help grow our audience. I, and I do apologize for the irregular publishing dates. Uh, I've had a ton of work stuff going on that's forcing me to present, travel, really eating up a lot of my time. Uh, but I, I still do want to hear from you, the listeners, what you think about the show. And if you have any guest ideas, I'd especially love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach me at settlersofsoul at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.